Hello, dear Hello. friend. Hello. I'd like to, on behalf of the uh, Clearwater Baha'i community, welcome each and every one of you to our uh, monthly meeting of the minds tonight. To all, to all of you who are those friends who are visiting the Baha'i Center for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. To all the returning friends, it's wonderful to see you. Uh, we have a, a wonderful presentation tonight, and before I actually introduce our speaker, just a, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, if you have, let's, let us give a, a gracious thank you to the friends who prepared the delicious meal. And please uh, either turn your cell phones off or put it on you know, buzzer so that it doesn't interrupt the presentation. And just uh, after the presentation, there will be a 15-minute period uh, to ask questions. And if we would, we don't want to exceed that. So just, you know, let's, let's keep it brief. Uh, our speaker for tonight is Mr. Gilbert Hakim. Uh, some of you know him. Some don't. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hakim is the uh, founder and CEO of SEC Stop Computer, which is headquartered in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, it's the uh, number one provider of laboratory information systems to the healthcare industry. There over, it has over 400 hospitals that are serviced. He graduated from Stony Brook University in New York, Long Island, with a bachelor's degree in physics and a master's degree in computer science and applied mathematics. He is a major force in the world of laboratory information systems. And his amazing vision, commitment, hard work has distinguished SEC Stock Computer as the number one provider of information technology to the healthcare industry. And although he travels tremendously, he somehow has found a balance to serve within the Baha'i community. And on Sundays, you'll often find him sitting here in this room facilitating the adult class, which we welcome you all to come and participate. It's very intimate. Uh, his presentation uh, is, in, is entitled Creator and Creation, Total Reality. Without further ado, please help me welcome to his children. Thank you very, very much. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the dinner, and I'm going to try to take you through a journey and try to entertain you as well as give you some information. So uh, first, I have to uh, talk about the disclaimer. Everything you see is plagiarized, stolen, <laughs> <laughs> borrowed from not only many different religions, but I googled them all. So. <laughs> So there's nothing here that can stick to me. <laughs> so the first thing we wanted to do is uh, basically talk about this uh, spiritual uh, talk. Uh, how people actually communicate. And this is a very good example of uh, history of Persian culture. And we picked one of the uh, very famous uh, poets, Persian poets, which is uh, familiar most of the foreigners are familiar with Omar Khayyam. And this is one of his uh, very good uh, poems. Uh, I first read it in Persian, Farsi, and then uh, we can translate it. Asrar azal ra na tu daniyo na ma. Bin hal muamma na tu daniyo na ma. Hast as hast parde guftegui man tu. Kun parde barofdad na tu mani yo na ma. So it says, the secret eternal, neither you know nor I. The, and the answers to the riddle, riddle of life, basically, neither you know nor I. Across the veil, there is our discussion. Why? When the veil falls, neither you remain nor I. So basically what it says is that human beings are actually uh, subjective uh, people. That means there is a veil and subjectively we communicate to one another. We should shun that. We should talk spiritually. 
Because the only thing that remains in the spirit that talks to spirit. Everything material disappears. So when the veil drops, which is the body disappears, the only thing that remains is the spirit. So this, as you see, the spirituality has been uh, woven into the poetic language of uh, uh, old cultures as well. So to entertain you a little bit more to see how difficult this change is for humanity, <laughs> this is from Saadi. If you take the donkey of Jesus to Mecca, when he comes back, he still is the donkey. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, all, we, we all have our own prejudices and our own visions. Uh, so, we should try to be disciple of Jesus, not uh, donkeys. <laughs> Jesus is donkey. <laughs> so, this is a very interesting... <laughs> Poem from uh, Saadi, which is one of the major uh, po poets of uh, Iran. So the discussion of today is really relates to uh, objective reality or total reality, the creator and creation, and which uh, total reality includes obviously spiritual reality and physical reality. So it's a combination of these two that makes uh, this total reality. There is no assumption here that whether God exists or not, whether the spiritual reality exists or not. The assumption is, if it exists, it would be part of this total reality. That's all the assumption there is. So there is no uh, funny thing going on, uh, generally. So, as far as physical reality is concerned, at the time of singularity means when the whole theory of Big Bang occurred, their assumption is that there was a, basically a mass the uh, size of a watermelon and it exploded and created reality. And ironically, as we know the laws of physics, that nothing gets created out of nothing. There must be something there, it transforms. Nothing dies, nothing gets created. Nothing gets added, nothing gets subtracted. The form changes. So this infinity that you see has caused enormous amount of problems for humanity because we are very familiar with death. You know, things die, things terminate. For us, something perpetual is very difficult to grasp. Very difficult. So this is a reality and let's find out, obviously, this particular matter that existed could have come from another dimension if it wasn't there to begin with. That's possible. And we're going to see how science last 50 years has transformed this idea and is trying to make sense out of it, generally. So we're going to really a little bit explore physical reality first and see basically what happened. If you look at basically all observable universe. That means everything that there is in the entire universe. You see that, that uh, one centimeter uh, size there? If this is the observable universe, that one centimeter is one billion light year. That means it's 10 billion billion kilometers. So that tiny thing that you see up there <laughs> is 10 billion billion kilometers. So you see how vast this thing is? It's quite intriguing actually. So that small ball has turned to this. And it's expanding. Now how does it expand? Where does it go? When the light actually travels from this universe, it creates space. So that's how it expands. As light travels, it expands. It creates space as it grows. So this is really what we're more familiar with, which is a picture of uh, basically universe, generally. Now we talk about <laughs> life on Earth. And this is a tiny, tiny speck in this tiny, tiny solar system. And we see something very different called life. And interestingly, 100% of our genes are exactly like chimpanzees. 100% 
90 98% of our DNA, which is the basically the hardware of life, is shared between us and chimpanzee. 95% of the DNA of humans are shared with a tree, as you see that car going right through it. <laughs> so you see the formula of life is very, very close. Very, very close. Unfortunately, Bob Harris is not here, otherwise I would have made you pick which one was Bob Harris. <laughs> <laughs> So these discoveries of physical reality, uh, what are these forces? As far as the last couple of centuries, uh, we found through scientific discoveries that there are really four laws that govern the entire universe that we discuss. That means any place in the universe you go, these four laws apply. But as we saw, it's quite intriguing that uh, in early 30s, Einstein, for example, was looking for a universal law. He says, look, we have one God, why don't we have one formula? Why the formula, for example, gravity doesn't work when you go inside the atom? It should work. So these four laws, laws of gravity, electromagnetism, weak nuclear force or strong nuclear force, they're completely different. That means that as you go from universe to inside the matter, these laws do not hold anymore. You have separate laws for the, every condition, and these are the four laws. So this force, the universal force or unity of forces, has been searched for for past uh, many, many dec decades. So the start of it was actually Einstein that was looking for something like this. And we're going to see what happens. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of uh, uh, basically discoveries called uh, for this unity of forces and string theory. I'm going to show you some clips of uh, public channel. Okay, great. I think now at least scientific community is in agreement that there are more dimensions than what we can see. So this is a major actually event that occurred about uh, I think 15 years ago. Two uh, physicists won the Nobel Prize for physics, uh, theoretical physics for discovery of string theory. So this multidimensional now gives us an aspect related to there are other methodology and world that people communicate through. So if you look at the Baha'i uh, uh, basically dispensation, you'll see there are signs and uh, directions toward worlds of God. That means that multi-dimensions so there is life after this physical reality that we're dealing with. So to define this particular uh, model of basically spiritual reality and physical reality, we need to pick a language. So we're going to start with some definitions, and then we use those definitions in a mathematical form. You don't need to be scared, I'm not going to use any math on you tonight that to describe actually objectively what we mean. So everybody is in tune. Because as you know, when we discuss, communicate, we use subjective language like uh, nice, warm, cold. These are basically feelings. These are really not accurate. This is subjective methodology of communication, generally. So let's start with some definition. Now let's talk about uh, the whole reality, the total reality is actual existence, whatever there is, past, present, and future. Reality is everything there is, where the verb to be is used in, in an atemporal, timeless, or eternal sense. So generally, this, um, for 
example, it allows the existence of transtemporal entities, entities existing outside space and time. So the spirit that we're talking about, or those dimensions, are outside space and time. If it exists, remember it's not making any assumption. If it exists, we call it whole reality, uh, generally. So therefore time is regarded as an independent dimension. So keep this in mind, we're going to come back to it. Now, I'm not sure if you remember, uh, a couple of years ago I did a presentation on minimalism, which was actually proof of mathematical proof of existence of creator. And what we did, this is uh, basically published by Dr. Hatcher, which uh, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago, uh, related to basically using set theory to prove that creator exists. And this proof was these four elements. There is a creator of whole reality. That means that creation cannot be without a creator. There must be a creator if there is a creation. It can't just spontaneously appear. As we know, in the laws of physics, nothing appears, nothing disappears, right? So there must be a creator. And this, is, this was proved. Uh, if anyone is interested, I have the PDF uh, book, a copy of the book that I can electronically email you if you're interested. Leave your email, I'll send it to you. The creator is simple, that means that it's non-composite. As you know, in the physical reality, anything that is composed eventually decomposes, eventually breaks down. So what is it that doesn't break down is simple, we call that simple. Creator is unique, universal uh, creator and is the cause of the existence of all phenomena. This was proven that there is one creator and this is the last one, one creator of all reality, and the, that creator created the entire universe, physical and spiritual. So this was proven before. Now we're going to say, for us to really communicate, we have to define laws, laws or axiom. Laws or axiom is that once it's proven, everybody agrees. We don't deny. Of course, uh, sometimes with some people, Reality has no meaning. <laughs> so they agree one day and disagree the next of the same subject. But in mathematical term, logic, axiom or postulate is a proposition that is not proved or demonstrated but considered to be either self-evident, like we exist, right? No, nobody can say we don't exist. And we are images and we don't, we're not here. So we exist. So there is a subject to necessary decision. Therefore, it is, its truth is taken for granted. So when we talk, so when we proved that, and this is the point I wanted to make, when we proved that the creator exists and one creator exists, we're not going to change our mind tomorrow. Once it's proven, we all agree it's there. Okay? So this is the, the tools, this language that we want to use to get where we want to go. Now, what happens if we look up and see an apple falling down, right? We can say that this, you know, laws of gravity, this is proven, and we're basically attraction of smaller mass to the larger mass. This is proven, so we all agree. Now, what if we're looking basically up, an apple com is coming down? Sometimes, what happens if we look up and we see the apple is moving away from us? What does this prove? Yes, yes, excellent. We are upside down. So you can't trust your senses. Law says that apple always falls. If apple always falls, that means you're upside down. This is really critical for us to understand what law means, what axiom means. Now, objective reality, and this is what we need to, to realize, is that objective reality is relating to a material object. That means exist. Once we agree it exists, we're not going to change our mind. 
actual existence. And this is this I picked up from Wikipedia of what objective reality means. Not influenced by emotions or prejudice. Based on observable fact. So that's what objective reality is. Now, what is subjective reality? Form as, <laughs> as in opinion, based on subjective feeling, intuition, not solely open observation or reasoning. Influenced by preconception within the observer, so coming more from within the observer rather than from observation of the external environment. This is a very important definition. It's uh, pertaining to personal mindset or experience, personal experience, arising from precept perceptive mental condition, lack in reality of substance. <laughs> That's possible. Ironically, philosophy and psychology was categorized, not by me, under uh, basically subjective reality. So this is really experienced by a person mentally and not directly verifiable by others. So this is really what's called subjective reality. Unfortunately, God gave us a brain and a soul the devices that we have, as the first poem that we read, this device, this brain, is subjective, is not objective. If you turn it around and you see the apple going down, it thinks that the apple is going up. So humans are subjective. So you consider this, keep it in the back of your mind. So all we know is that Euclid is one of the pioneers of mathematics, uh, basically we know ma science of mathematics is the basis of all science. So we're going to use this particular model of argument and logic. So mathematics is study of quantity, structure, space, and relation. Uh, number, space, uh, natural sciences, computer, abstraction even, and other entity. So it really covers everything objectively. Not subjectively, objective. So what are the knowledge? They're, they're, we call this knowledge or civilization as we know it, are two parts. Spiritual reality knowledge, which is source of all spiritual civilization. And you have physical reality knowledge. Who discovered or what was the revelation? What was the source of revelation? Adam, Buddha, Krishna, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Bab, Baha'u'llah. Those areas also are divided into two separate, distinct revelations. One is, one is uh, basically spiritual reality revelation and material reality revelation. I'm going to describe these two a little bit later what they mean. Same thing is physical reality knowledge, which was discovered by scientists. Now, I'm sure many of you know these things, and whoever hated algebra in high school, <laughs> this was the guy who put you to, <laughs> to misery you didn't want to go through. <laughs> this is Muhammad ibn Musa Khwarazmi. He was the inventor of algebra, uh, basically. He was a Muslim, actually. So science is also divided into two distinct branches. One is natural sciences and social sciences. What are the natural sciences? These are precise, exact sciences, objective. Social sciences, obviously, is varied, you know, is variable or is subjective. Same thing here. We have a spiritual reality revelation, which is fixed. It's attributes of God, we're going to get there. And we have material reality civilization. Revelation that comes com from God that governs material world. So the spiritual 
basically laws that come for material reality. Okay? So now it's pretty clear, I guess. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> so we talk about simple and complex phenomenon. Uh, simple is obviously it's the unique, indivisible, one entity, everlasting, atemporal, which is example is soul of a man. Complex, which is uh, divisible, limited lifespan, combination of elements, and is temporal. Eventually, it dissolves. Now, world of existence, as far as the Baha'i doctrine is concerned, is divided into three different planes, or three different dimensions. Obviously, deity, which is the creator. You have prophethood, which is really messenger of creator. So they have the world of their own. And of course, servitude, which is all, all of us mortal, basically. So here we have uh, man, which is in physical world. Now, creator is an unknown essence. It is simple, unique, and self-caused. Means there is nobody that caused this creator. All of this was proven with the minimalism before. Prophet's soul, which is basically simple, pre pre-existent, and we're gonna dig dig a little bit further down. And of course, there is, there is many of them that the God sends from this particular prophethood world to our world. And of course, man's soul, which emanates from Creator at the time of conception. That means we, our soul didn't exist, and at the time of conception, emanates from God. That's where we start, basically. Now, one subject which is, uh, had confused me for many, many years, and I finally figured out, is there is a difference between entity or essence, called soul, and what emanates from soul. So when you read the writings, they talk about spirit, for example. Spirit sometimes is synonymously used to define soul. The reason is this. If Quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. So the question really is that spirit is what emanates from a phenomenon. So vegetable spirit emanates from a complex phenomena of those DNA, those molecules and those genes that makes a plant. But it's complex. So what happens if it dies, it just disappears. The spirit of plant disappears. Right? Animal spirit. I mean, animal spirit again emanates from a complex phenomenon. These are basically genes and cells that are combined and behavior of an animal is always the same. It's a complex phenomenon and when basically animal dies, it just disintegrates. Nothing would be left from it. But what we call spirit means that what emanates. You see movement from an animal. You see fear, actually. You see ferocity in animal. But what you see is what emanates from them, from that complex phenomenon. There is another one called spirit of human spirit. So one you, once you call uh, basically this human spirit, is really not soul. What we define for, uh, for clarity of, uh, of communication is what emanates from soul we call a spirit. Now, in this case, soul of a human being, as we explained before, is simple. So it never dies. It emanates from God, it's one entity, it never breaks down, the body that surrounds it disappears, but this particular single phenomenon would basically live forever. So what emanates from our soul called human spirit? There is another one called spirit of faith. That means this soul has a characteristic that cannot be found in any other animal except human. And this is called spirit of faith which emanates from that soul, which is single phenomena. 
and it comes from breath of Holy, Holy Spirit. And I'll describe this Holy Spirit a little bit later. That means that when you read the Word of God, unknowingly it changes you. And that's what it creates out of your soul, the spirit of faith, which didn't exist before. And only through Holy Spirit or Word of God, this spirit gets created in the soul. No other way. And of course we have Holy Spirit or Word of God. Now this emanates from Holy Ghost, and of course this is what emanates from spirit of the manifestations or prophets, basically. So, Holy Spirit is the mediator, this is uh, Abdul Baha's description of uh, basically Holy Spirit, is the mediator between God and His creature. But remember, we're talking, not talking about entity here. We're talking about action that comes from some, some complex phenomenon. Now the reason some of the writings interchanges the spirit and soul, they use it interchangeably, is because of this. You cannot say outwardly, this particular person is a tyrant, he's a liar, he's deceit, and then say, look, uh, this guy internal is a good guy. Because we don't really care. <laughs> right? You see what the spirit that emanates from the guy, you don't care what his essence or his soul is what emanates from him. So if his spirit is not so good, you don't call him good. And this is really the reality of difference between spirit and entity that is called soul, soul of a man. Okay, now we're there. Now, scientific fields, as we mentioned, mirror, mirror spiritual reality. What are these two? One is natural sciences. What are the natural sciences? Is study of natural phenomenon, including biological life. Number two is social sciences. So one is objective, the other one is subjective. Right? Change. Subject to change. So study of human behavior, societies, these grouping are empirical sciences, which means the knowledge must be based on observ observable phenomena. Although it is based on observable, observable phenomena, but it changes. As human uh, maturity increases, right? these laws changes, the human behavior changes. So these sciences are completely changeable. But guess what? Gravity would stay gravity from beginning of the time to the end of time. So this segment related to the natural sciences are fixed. They don't change. They always stay the same. Now, social sciences, every cycle, every new discoveries, is subjective and it, it, you would learn the new sciences, new human behavior, generally. Now here we, we discuss unity of forces, which these are part of the uh, physical reality laws, which we discussed before. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But now, what is spiritual reality knowledge? Again, the spiritual reality knowledge are two. Fixed. What are the fixed? These are fixed pertaining to a spiritual world. That means that virtues of creator, which is latent in man. That means we have, we have the seed of it in us potentiality of all the words uh, or names of God, virtues of God are in us. And that's fixed. So it comes to, uh, and it's unchangeable. And it's common in all religion. There is no religion you can find that is different. All of these laws, from Adam to Baha'u'llah, all of them are exactly the same. There is a second portion, similar to sciences, the practical laws for physical world, which is variable. Laws for human interaction and ritual, changed on every new manifestation revelation. So when new manifestation comes in, only changes those segments that are variable. Very similar to sciences. 
So what we're trying to prove really is that science and religions are continuation of the same reality. They operate exactly the same way. They have the same subjective and objective phenomenon built into it. And they're not different. They're one and the same. Now, let's find out what Abdul Baha, which is son of the founder of Baha'i religion, uh, basically describes these two aspects of spiritual laws. The law of God is divided into two parts. One is fundamental basis, which comprises all spiritual things. That is to say, it refers to the spiritual virtues and divine qualities. This does not change nor alter. It is the holy of holies, which is the essence of the law of <coughs> Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Christ, Muhammad, the Bab, and Baha'u'llah, and which lasts and is established in all the prophetic cycles. It will never be abrogated, for it is spiritual and not material. Food. It is faith, knowledge, certitude, Listen to these words. These are not physical attributes of your, your brain. These are spiritual attributes of your brain. So faith, knowledge, certitude, justice, piety, righteousness, trustworthiness, love of God, benevolence. There is no area in your brain that relates to justice. There is no area in your brain that relates to certitude. No area found. No one claims they found it. All of these resides in your soul. Nowhere else. Purity, detachment, humility, meekness, patience, constancy. So you see that your, your spirit has abilities that has been latent in man since beginning of time. This is not something we just discovered. So what is the next one? The second part, what does Abdul Baha says regarding the second part? The second part of religion of God, which refers to material world and which comprises fasting, prayer, thank you, forms of worship, marriage, divorce, abolition of slavery, legal processes, transactions, indemnities for murder, violence, theft, and injury. So now you see this is the variable which is very similar to what science is called psychology, right? <laughs> Sociology. Very similar, very similar. So this part of the law of God, which refers to material things, is modified and altered in each prophetic cycle, in accordance with the necessities of time. So it's very simple. What we're trying to go is, remember the first slide I showed you? We're looking for one force, unity. We're looking for unity. So now we're trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together to come to, to this unity generally. And I'm going to quiz you afterwards, so pay good attention. <laughs> so what is a human soul? It's simple, new, everlasting. Soul of a man emanates from the Creator at the time of conception. Human soul is pure, contrary to other beliefs, which man is man-made, by the way. None of the other religion has said figment of human imagination. That's right. Sorry, my English is poor. So, human soul is pure and has inherited an innate characteristic that, that are all good. There is nothing God creates that is bad. Nothing. Now, character of a man, which is spirit of the man, right? We're not talking about his soul. Character of a man is formed by use of this innate and inherited, which are all good, some weak in some areas, some strong on the other area. But they're all good. Characters to acquire knowledge and behavior. Therefore, character of a man is mostly acquired. 
which is formed through education. So if you get wrong education, you end up in a wrong place. So there is nothing in you that is bad or inherent. Yes, ma'am. It starts, unfortunately, that way we mess it up <laughs> as we go on. So you see, that's, that's the whole key about the human soul and purity of human soul. That's why before you're adult, anything you do is, is not responsibility of you. See? The, the child, if it passes on to the other world, has no sin whatsoever. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so education, if you teach wrong thing to your children, they end up wrong. If you teach them the right thing, they end up right. No, there is no exceptions. Unfortunately, mathematics has no exceptions. <laughs> it's objective. We're trying to go to objective reality. So, what is this manifestation soul? So we talk about human soul, which was a time of conception. What is different? How do, obviously, these manifestations communicate with God that humans cannot? As we know, only Moses can talk to the burning bush. No human being, whoever calls, as Jesus said, whoever claims to do it is an imposter. Right? Only manifestations of God talk to, to God. No one else. So, the soul of a manifestation is obviously, or, or uh, prophets, have three conditions. This is Abdul Baha's uh, description of the soul of a manifestation. One is the physical condition, they look like us, they have rational soul like us, so they can make judgment as we do. The other area of the manifestation is the perfections of lordly splendor or Holy Spirit. That means that they reflect what God wants and nothing else, nothing more. So I'll, I'll compare these two together so it becomes very, very clear. Clear as a mud. Wait a couple of minutes. Now, some of these manifestations, and this is recollection of Jesus, and this is some people really uh, relate to manifestation that, well, these were human being, ordinary human being, and then God randomly picked that guy and just says, look, you're going to be now the manifestation of God. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So when, and this is misinterpretation of Bible that obviously is translated by, by mortal beings, and they basically uh, didn't portray the reality of Jesus Christ. So let's see what Jesus said. I was sleeping and unconscious. The breeze of God passed over me and awoke me and commanded me to proclaim the word. Now, reality of this, when Christ in his 30th year was baptized, basically, and Holy Spirit descended upon him before he this, the Holy Spirit did not manifest itself. He didn't say, I am Jesus Christ. All these things refer to the bodily condition of manifestation. It wasn't referred to the Holy Spirit that we talked about. Their heavenly condition, which we did, talked about of manifestation, this is Abdul Baha's uh, interpretation, their heavenly condition embraces all things knows all mysteries, discovers all signs, and rules over all things, before as well as after the mission. It is the same. That means they have knowledge of all sciences, they have knowledge of all reality, way before. What does this pertain to? Their basically soul is pre-existent. The soul didn't get emanated at the time of conception the way our soul does. <laughs> yes, they know that they're, they're different. That's correct. They're aware of their, their station. That's correct. So let's see the comparison. Solar manifestation is simple like ours, is everlasting like ours. 
is it, it has innate and inherited characteristics like ours, right? It's ancient, it's pre-existent. Ours is basically new. It's born at the time of conception. They reflect will of God. But we have free will. That's where things go wrong, right? We choose. <laughs> Emanates rational spirit. That means that they have rational capabilities. They judge things like we do as well. Emanates Holy Spirit. So what he does, he actually reflects, like a perfect mirror, reflects what God wants us to know. In our environment, it's we acquire heavenly spirit, which is spirit of faith. And we only can acquire the spirit of faith to what? Holy Spirit. There is no other way. You can't invent these things. It comes through revelation. The mechanism of spiritual civilization is basically emanation from God. It's not discovery. It's been there, it comes from God, and it's distributed to us. It has innate knowledge of reality. We have a core knowledge of reality. We have to study to find out science. They know. They know all of it. Both physical and spiritual. They're recipient of revelation. They're conduit of revelation. We have no direct contact with God. So this is clearly shows this world of prophets, where they come from, the essence of their spirit, and how it differs with our spirit. And again, this is definition so we get to the point in terms of uh, continuity or unity. We're trying to prove unity, generally. So what is it that uh, we create? We have spiritual civilization and progress. Uh, revelation is gradual by time, right? What are sciences? Material civilization progress. Discovery is gradual by time. It's very similar. You have revelation, it's cumulative. No manifestation comes in and says the other guy didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> He uses actually and describes, he becomes the interpreter of the old revelation. So it is cumulative. Revelation is incremental. It adds it. Science is incremental as well. Revelation is by manifestation. Science is by scientists. Right? Revelation is objective. And this is what people don't quite re realize. That means that every word that comes from the manifestation of God is objective. It has one meaning. And it's precise. It's not subject to interpretation. We cannot take this, read it, and translate it for ourselves, whichever we like it. Because why? Our brain is subjective, remember? So you have to read it continuously, over and over and over and over. Okay? Revelation advances civilization, and we're going to reference this, why revelation advances civilization. Both material and spiritual civilization. Science advances material civilization, obviously. Now we don't ride in donkeys anymore, yeah, we have cars. Sometimes, that's right. <laughs> Le revelation eliminates error, and this is the key. Discrimination of race, gender, is error. Science eliminates error. World is not flat. It's not because I said so. So science is objective. The same way revelation is objective. Revelation provides guidance. Science provides guidance. If you know that you're going to fall into a well, deep well, obviously you're going to avoid it. The same way revelation provides guidance so you don't fall into what? Sin, right? So that's, that's 
Revelation regulates total reality. Science regulates physical reality. So this is really, as we see, there is one science. There is not multiple sciences. Science belongs to physical reality. There is one religion. Because it's science of spiritual reality, there is one creator. Right? So now, <laughs> which came first? <laughs> Chicken or egg? <laughs> now, what spiritual... Yes. <laughs> The revelations are basically messages that comes from God and only goes to selected people called prophets. These are words of God. It's a method of communication. The antenna of the manifestations only tuned to God. So when God speaks, the, the only guy who hears it is the manifestation and nobody else. Now what happens is that the manifestation grabs this based on what they see, because God is not in physical reality. Based on what they see, they disperse this Holy Spirit or Word of God, depends on see what sickness the humanity has. So revelation is like a shower. Comes down to manifestation and manifestation literally looks at it and picks and chooses. So look, these idiots are not going to get it. So let's erase some of these laws. These human, humans are not uh, intelligent enough to be able to exercise it. So manifestations actually regulate based on what they see. The humanity's progress is, they reveal that portion for the next cycle. And what they do is say, look, I'm not going to tell you this, I'm going to leave it to the next guy. See, next manifestation come. Unfortunately, we don't do too well with these manifestations. We grab them, we put them on cross, <laughs> we do a lot of bad things to them. <laughs> so, let's go back to the original <laughs> question. So, which one was came first? Was the spiritual, spirituality or Basically, spiritual civilization came in that triggered or jump-started the physical reality sciences or discoveries. Or sciences really created a need and then spirituality came to regulate it. Which one came first? What do you think? Okay, let's see what, what, what Abdul Waha says about this. Revelation has always preceded discoveries of physical reality. All praise and honor be to the day spring of divine wisdom. Divine wisdom, the dawning point of revelation, Muhammad, and the holy line of his descendants, since by the widespread rays of his consummate wisdom, his universal knowledge, those savage denizens of Yasreb, Medina, and Bath, which is Bata, which is Mecca, miraculously and in so brief a time were drawn out of the depth of their ignorance, rose up to the pinnacles of learning and became centers of art and sciences, and human perfection, and stars of felicity and true civilization, shining across the horizon of the, the world. So, well, we'll, we'll let me finish this, we're going to discuss those. <laughs> so, reality is this, that the trigger, the mechanism, if you put yourself in the shoes of the Creator, if you allow discoveries to come on, wouldn't you send the instruction set before they find out how to drive the car? It's like, you know, giving somebody a car without telling them how to drive it. Obviously, it will not happen. Re physical reality, sciences gets discovered because this spiritual reality releases the potentiality in man to discover this physical reality. 
the instruction set comes in. So spiritual civilization pr uh, precedes material civilization. Now, humanity can ignore spiritual civilization. And guess what happens? We're in the position we're in now. Abdul Baha says when he came to the United States is that he has a prayer that says let the, the spiritual civilization be augmented in this country where the material civilization has progressed enormously. Now we have an imbalance. That means that we have discovered stuff but we haven't applied the laws of God. The spiritual law. And this is why we're in the mess that we're in right now. That spiritual reality or material reality that came from manifestation, came from last manifestation, we have not applied. And guess what? We have wars, we have famines, and every other manifestation has described this condition. And guess what? 20th century, we all experienced it. And we still do. Do experience it. Now, the, the key that I found relates to the, the correlation of revelation and discoveries. And this is what Abdul Waha's writing is, that know that reality of a man embraces the reality of things and discovers the verities, properties, and secrets of things. So all these arts, wonders, sciences, and knowledge have been discovered by the human reality. So obviously we can find things. These discoveries corresponding to the reality are similar to revelation, which is spiritual comprehension, divine inspiration, and the association of human spirit. So it's fairly similar. Now what is the meaning and purpose of religion, generally? Religion is the outer expression of divine reality. Therefore, it must be living, vitalized, moving, and progressive. If it be without motion and non-progressive, it is without the divine life. It is dead. The divine institutes are continuously active and evolutionary. Therefore, the revelation of them must be progressive and continue. So it's fairly straightforward. What's the mission of the Prophet? The revelation of the holy books, the manifestation of the heavenly teachers, and the purpose of divine philosophy all center in the training of the human reality so that they may become clear and pure as mirrors and reflect the light and love of the Son of Reality. So this is really the purpose of mission of the Prophet, uh, generally. So here, what is the purpose of religion? First, is obviously guide individual to acquire a spirit of faith, right? Which is all virtues or names of the Creator. To avoid sin and error under protection of the Holy Spirit. So when you apply these laws, you're under the protection of God, basically. Second one is to create ever advancing civilization. This civilization is both material and spiritual. So it's not really came in to make us live here uh, comfortably. It is to basically exercise and advance the civilization to the next stage. Which is what? Unity of mankind, new cycle of revelation. So the key really relates to, if you look, examine all the prior dispensation. You see, all of them promised this collective day of God on earth. That means that a time will come that humanity would unite. And if you look at everybody's basically uh, book that came from God, they all have a promised day. Day of basically second coming of Jesus. When people make uh, swords into plowshares, right? So this concept has been around for a long, long time. So now what we're going to do is uh, look at the history of religion and then we're going to make you a quiz. How's that? 
Okay, see whether you're paying attention or not. So what we're going to do here, if I can turn this on, this is the history of religion. It's birth of Krishna, which is 3,000 before Christ. You have 2,000 before Christ, birth of Abraham. Remember Abraham, right? Judaism started a little bit after that. Then Hinduism started 480, approximately. Birth of Buddha, which is the... So that Buddhism started, right? Death of Jesus. Now this is Christianity started there. In about 570 is birth of Muhammad, which is the Muslim religion. Right? Remember Abraham. I'm going to ask you a question. No, just remember Abraham. So you see as Islam, right? Now this fighting starts. Uh, you have this progression of Islam, and then Christianity starts to develop. And then, Israel is formed. Right? So if you go throughout the thing, I'll talk about it, don't worry about it. So now we have a problem, big problem. Remember Abraham? You know, you know that all other manifestations claim to be related to Abraham? Right? All of them. Guess what? All of them said, with, when the state of Israel Children of Israel come home. The state of Israel is formed. My second coming has arrived. No, second coming, no. When, when Jews go back into their homeland and create a state, that means that my second, Jesus' second coming is there. Sunnis believe in return of Jesus. Shiites be believe in the retu return of Imam Hussein. Uh, uh, Buddhists are waiting for fifth Buddha. I'll, I have a slide, I'll show you that. General. But we have a problem. Now, obviously, all of them prophesy that when this thing occurs, right, that day of God on earth has been established. But where is it? Abraham, we're trying to basically make an honest person out of Abraham because he said, when this thing is, is there, you're going to have new religion. So let's find out, okay, let's find out what actually... Now let's see allegoric references to this new religion. Now, I picked what Jesus said. No man drinks old wine and immediately desire to drink new wine. So basically, he said new religion is distasteful to old scholars. It's not really tasteful. And new wine, which is new religion, is not put into old wineskin. Old tradition. Lest they burst. It means that, basically, it won't hold it. No, 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 leave it, leave it for the time. Leave it, leave it. So new religion, new religion destroys the old way of life. You cannot keep your old way of life. Nor is old wine, which is old religion, put into a new wineskin like new tradition. You cannot apply the old religion in, into the new way of life that we have now. Let's it spoils it. The religion itself gets spoiled.
old religion gets spoiled in the new way of life. You cannot apply it. An old patch is not sewn onto a new garment because a tear would result. That means old religion cannot be used in the new way of life. It will be useless completely. It tears. It tears apart. And obviously, so you see this, the old manifestations actually prophesize that you cannot use their old religion. Those religions that we described cannot be used to achieve that day of God. So let's figure out, actually, the golden Baha'i rules. <laughs> so what are these? Unity of God, unity of religion, unity of humankind. Equality of man and woman, elimination of all forms of prejudices, world peace, harmony of religion and science, independent investigation of the truth, universal compulsory education, universal auxiliary language, obedience to government and non-involvement in partisan politics, elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. But guess what? These ideas generated 166 years ago. It didn't generate now. At that time, no one could even believe the equality of man and would be possible. No one could believe actually Jews and Christians and Muslims and Buddhists sit across one table and eat from the same table. We did tonight. <laughs> So as you see, this idea is revealed through revelation and for us humans, with our subjective mind, we just find it. We don't invent these things, we just find them. So reality is that these are basically the roadmap of achieving that world unity and basically that day of God on earth that Abraham promised. So the religion, the new revelation has occurred. Abraham wasn't kidding when he said, when the state of Israel is, is formed, the new religion revelation has come already. So these are the references which is uh, to glory of God, which is in all manifestations, that talking about this day, uh, basically to Israelite is Lord of hosts to Christendom is the glory of the Father to, to Shia Islam is Imam Hussein Sunni Islam is Spirit of God which is Jesus Christ Zoroastrian is Shah Bahram Hindus is the reincarnation of Krishna to Buddhist the Buddha and to Baha'u'llah refer to Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are actually from Bible, uh, from uh, Old Testament. Glory of the Lord, which is name of Baha'u'llah is glory of the Lord, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These are all uh, titles that is in prior manifestation, pointing at this manifestation. Now, and these are, it says, shall judge among the nation, shall assemble the outcast of Israel. This is the Old Testament. And guess what happened? The outcast of Israel are assembled. And they have a pretty powerful uh, country right now. So now, if you like to see the, this is the son of the manifestation of God that visited, and he was the one that mentioned that this revelation, this new revelation, new civilization has already started. The material civilization has surpassed, in 20th century has surpassed the spiritual civilization. And because of that, we're suffering. Unless and until that material civilization is harnessed by the spiritual civilization, the use, limits,
controls are put in place, humanity will suffer until spiritual civilization equates to this material civilization. And to, for the first time in the history of mankind, Revelation has given a roadmap as well. It means that after manifestations passing, there is a guardian or basically successor to that, which after Abdul Baha is Shoghi Effendi, became the guardian of the Baha'i faith and sole interpreter of the word of God. And of course, now you see Universal House of Justice, which is freely elected people from all over the world, regardless of their natural origin, language, or prior history, being elected to this body that governs and interpreted laws of God. Thank you very much. <laughs>